Welcome everybody to another episode of Indie Reads Aloud. Today we're going to listen to some fantasy read to us by Douglas S. Pierce. Doug is a good friend of the program and a personal friend of mine, so I'm very excited to have him back. Thanks, Doug. Thank you, Diana. I'm glad to be here. I, I'm so excited to have you because, um, well, first of all, I love having my friends on the program. But secondly, yours is a genre that I have not, I don't think I've had on the program yet. So awesome. this is going to be kind of fun. I hope so. Um, this is Epic Fantasy, and the book is titled The Hunted Maiden, correct? Correct. Yay, I love it when I get it right. <laughs> so Douglas S. Pierce is a husband and father who lives in Metro Detroit, with his wife, Patricia, of more than 25 years. Congratulations on that milestone. Yes. Yay. They have two Shiba Inu, Inus, um, Akira and Yuna, and a black cat named Harley. He is a proud veteran of the United States military and a practicing pagan. Raised on weekly trips to libraries and bookstores, Doug has had a lifelong love affair with the kind of stories that inspire hope, kindness, and love. And before we go on any further, I genuinely want to say thank you for your service. Well, thank you. Um, I was speaking with a veteran earlier in another podcast, and I will tell you what I told her, which is I am genuinely appreciative of your service. It is because of you that my son was not required to serve. So thank you for giving him that choice. You're very welcome. Return this kindness by giving the gift of music to someone else in their time of need. Mouse, a fugitive and former stowaway, dreams of becoming a musician. By following the melody of his heart, he hopes to escape the grueling work and harsh punishments doled out aboard the hunter's ghost. Gifted a flute by an enigmatic man, he finds himself closer than ever to achieving his goal. Yet, to his surprise, it's not freedom the music leads him to, but a strange fey prisoner. She alone is the sole being he's ever encountered with a personal song. The enemy comes for you, child, a foe like no other. Those dark words spoken by an ancient seer haunt, aerialist, that's a mouthful, and animal trainer, Sheldies, every waking thought. While dangerous strangers kidnap her in the midst of a deadly fey storm, she fears this malicious threat is coming to pass. Now, her survival depends on escaping from the ship she's been held on and fighting away back home before the shadowy being, known only as the enemy, comes for her. Forced together by their intertwining fates, Mouse and Sheldy, embark on a quest to uncover the secrets of Sheldy's past. Can they, can they arm themselves with her precious truth in time to fight the dark forces eager to claim and corrupt her? Fans of epic fantasy will love the journey of sacrifice and hope found in the Hunted Maiden. I am so excited to hear you read this. This is going to be a good time. So... When you are ready, Mr. Pierce, please take the microphone and read aloud. Excellent. Okay. Chapter one. Just don't look down. Clutching the thick wood of the starboard wingmast with his knees, Mouse focused on the task at hand rather than the fact that he was perched on a relatively thin piece of wood that was the only thing between him and thousands of feet of open space immediately below. Fumbling against the biting wind, he jammed the end of the fraying rope through the second-to-last grommet of the tarp. His usually dexterous fingers had become clumsy and reluctant lumps of flesh in the frigid, in, in the frigid late fannel wind. Tiny bits of ice clung to his eyelashes. Every inch of exposed skin burned as if a thousand bees were stinging him. Another gust blasted up through the tight space between the mast and the side of the ship. It tore the edge of the tarp from his frozen fingers, yanking the end of the rope free of several hard-won grommets. By the blazing fires of the fallen star, swallowing his frustration, Mouse tightened his grip and leaned out into the open air. Just don't look down. 
The canvas snapped and popped in the howling wind, dancing to its own wild music. Stretching further out over the void, Mouse snatched at, in vain at the, flapping at the flapping corner. As quickly as it came, though, the wind died. The entire ship settled into an unnatural stillness. The normal creaking and groaning of the wooden hull faded into eerie, uneasy silence, punctuated by the soft slap of the tarp settling back into place. The sudden stillness in the midst of an oncoming storm could only mean one thing. Oh, shards! Mouse flattened, up, flattened out over the tarp and squeezed his eyes shut. Don't look down! He hugged the mast with both arms and legs. With a screech that reminded him of the full-throated cries of a slant-worn whore being cheated out of her hard-earned coin, the wind washed over Mouse in an unstoppable wave. It slammed into the starboard side of the hunter's ghost, with unimaginable force sweeping the ship into the padded bumper, poles extending from the stone pier. The impact rolled through every board, mast, and line of rigging with bone-jarring force. Above him, a dozen curses and cries of pain erupted as the rest of the crew scrambled to hold on to the higher rigging of the vertical mass of which, or were knocked down from their feet on the main deck. Beneath him, the wing mast bucked, flinging him several feet up into the air. At the apex of his brief rise, a second surging counterdraft caught the inside of Mouse's jacket, spreading the unbuttoned flaps to either side of his body like the wings of a bird in flight. Time slowed. Movement ceased. Suspended in the gap between the tip of the folded up wing mast and the massive hull, Mouse couldn't help himself. He looked down. And in that single moment before the, he began to fall, the breathtaking beauty of the view spooling out below him and around him overcame the sheer terror gripping at his heart. Extending both down and out on either side of his flailing bare feet, the cliffs of the island of Timo stretched as far as he could see. The uneven gray surface was pocked with ledges and crevices. Below each of them were streaks of shite and the countless generations of annoying shore gulls that had built their nests in them. To his right, the wooden masts of the of the hull obscured obscured his view of the stone docks and the port of Nashe beyond. A towering mass of dark clouds loomed across the western horizon. The roiling formation with every bit was every bit as large and imposing as the stone cliffs that, that framed his eastern view. Lightning danced in dozens of places along the fleeting edge of the storm, creating images of the of the charming of, of the churning darkness that reminded him of faces, feminine faces twisted into grimaces of unfathomable rage. Blinking, Mouse shifted his gaze down towards the interior, thousands of feet below. The winding blue ribbons of water and the button-sized lakes dotting the landscape lacked the characteristic sparkle that they had in the bright sunlight of a cloudless day. The verdant greens of the forest and the rich browns of the fertile soil were dulled by the shadows cast by the incoming storm. I'm flying again. The illusion of flight, however, evaporated as quickly as it came. Dropping like a stone through the narrow gap between the folded up wing mast and the hull, Mouse reached out in desperation, flailing for the rope ladder. Twice the thick rain slipped hemp slipped through frozen fingers, but on the third try, he managed to keep a grip on the bottom run, bottom most rung. Jerked to a halt in mid-fall, his body twisted in the air, slamming, he slammed into the hull back first. Whoop. The jarring impact sent searing waves of pain flaring out from the sides of the scabbed over wounds that scored the length of his back. Convulsing in agony, Mouse nearly lost his grip. It took every bit of strength and determination that remained within him to push with his left heel and flip his body around. Don't look down. Gritting his teeth against the fresh waves of pain, Mouse began to climb. It wasn't until he pulled himself up several rungs onto the onto the ladder that the realization of how close he'd come to dying hit him. Intertwining his trembling limbs into the ropes, Mouse pressed his forehead against the solid warmth of the hull and gasped for breath. The relentless pounding of his heart against his eardrums obscured everything else until a deep and familiar voice called out from above, cutting through both the rushing wind and his hammering pulse. Mouse! Dalton leaned out over the railing. His long forked beard flapped against either side of his otherwise bald head. What are you doing down there with no blast and safety harness? The man waved a meaty hand. Get your land-loving arse back up here. 
Moss scampered obediently up the rope ladder until a pair of strong hands grabbed his collar and yanked him roughly over the railing. What in the blazes were you thinking, lad? Dalton thundered over his swirling winds. Don't you ever pull that shite again, you hear me? Staggering under the combined onslaught of the storm's wind and the barely constrained fury of Dalton's normally calm and steady personal song, Mouse raised his hands in futile defense. But Jigger said, Listen to that fool and get you killed right blasted quick, son. Still holding the lapels of Mouse's jacket, Dalton jerked him upright. I can't watch your scrawny arse and keep these bastards working hard enough to batten the ship down at the same blasted time. I'm 19 years old and a deckhand of the ship, Mouse bit back. He brushed the larger man's hands aside, stood up to his full height and just over five feet, eight inches tall, and brushed his wind-blown hair from his equally brown, eye, brown eyes. So I need to do my share, or they're just going to keep seeing me as, I know, boy, Dalton cut him off. I know you mean well, but you're a bleeding fool. Swept up by the power of music flowing from the old sailor into him, Mouse lost track of what Dalton was shouting at him. His consciousness flowed instead into the stream of the man's raucous music, as naturally as those annoying shore gulls rode the constant eddies and swirls of the wind bouncing off of the cliffs. He slipped past the strains that showed the deep concern the heavy set man had for him and those that were focused on his responsibility to prepare the ship for the looming storm. His, intent, his interest was captured instead by the vibrant images of a heavy-set, smiling woman bright -eyed and bright-eyed children gathered round Dalton as he returned home from yet another long voyage. Mouse! Strong hands found his shoulders, giving them a hard squeeze. Mouse, wake up, blast you. Ah, fresh pain. Fresh pain needling down his back jolted him out of his reverie. Ow, I'm sorry, son. Ma Dalton dropped his hands from Mouse's shoulders as if they were on fire. I did not mean to hurt you, but sometimes I uh, sucked, Mouse sucked in his breath and leaned back, trying to avoid reopening any more of his still healing scabs. I know, Dalton. What's happening to you, boy? Concern clouded the bald man's eyes. He pointed to Mouse's head. Where do you keep going or disappearing to in there? I'm sorry. I wish I could explain it. Whatever the reason, boy, you need to stop daydreaming so much or someday it'll land you in more trouble then your glib tongue can talk you out of, Dalton sighed. Never mind, I've got something else for you to do, something that'll help you more, help more than you trying to try your hand at any more of this, jib, this here jib work. What's that? I need you to go into town, Dalton nodded towards the uh, shore and, and pressed a small pouch of coins into his hand. And get some grog for these thirsty bastards. They'll work harder if and they know something good's waiting for them at the end of, of all this blasted effort. Turning a corner on the cobbled streets of ancient Nashe, Mouse looked up and paused. Soaring high over the nearest buildings were the seven impossible impossibly tall and thin spires of the Jalrun Conservatory of the Arts, gleaming against an otherwise gloomy sky. The shimmering marble-faced towers dwarfed the, the squat stone and wood buildings of the small city that had grown up around the many generations of, exist of its existence as the premier school for artists, musicians, and performers in the known world. Someday, he whispered to himself, I'm going to study there. Digging into his pocket, he thumbed the squared off edges of the iron quads poking through the thin fabric of the pouch. Maybe, there, maybe there'll be enough change left from the grog, he thought. I can, I can buy a cheap flute. He shook the thought from his head. It'd be, I'd be better off just stealing one. Mouse stopped stomped each bare foot in place. He couldn't stop shivering. The soles of his feet were thick with calluses, but that thickened skin couldn't stop his toes from going numb because of the cold. He pushed his hands into the pockets of his threadbare uniform jacket and pulled it tighter against his thin frame. Ducking his head inside the, the upraised collar, he forced one foot in front of the other, moving towards his assigned destination rather than the one that occupied his dreams. Ugh. Staggered by the bone-jarring impact with a hooded figure he hadn't noticed before, Mouse's backside landed hard on the rough cobblestones. He grunted as, as the fresh agony lancing up the scabs lining his back. A massive figure loomed over him, unmoved by the force of their collision, except for the hood of his cloak. The slipping fabric revealed the ruddy complexion, sharply pointed ears, and thick boned features of an orc. The orc narrowed his eyes and scowled down at him. 
In his far hand, he held an iron-tipped wooden staff as thick as Mouse's wrists. Watch where you're going, boy, the big orc snarled in a clipped accent through the lip, through thin lips and pointed teeth. Gulping, Mouse stared up at him. He was every bit as tall and broad through the shoulders as the captain was, but with none of the fat that softened the familiar man's profile. I'm sorry, Tonkul, Mouse held up his empty hands. The orc's eyes flashed. He spun on his heel, gripping the staff in both clawed hands as he took a menacing step closer. What did you just call? A second figure emerged from the alleyway. He slipped between them with the easy grace of a trained dancer. The still hooded figure placed a restraining hand on the staff as he looked down, to, down at Mouse. The piercing blue eyes of a smiling, middle-aged human regarded him. Easy, friend. I'm sure the lad meant no insult, the man said in a deeply melodic voice. He offered his other hand to Mouse. Isn't that right, son? No, I mean, yes, sir. Mouse reached reached for the off offered hand without thinking. I thought that Tankul was the proper address for an orc. It can be, the man nodded as his calloused hands gripped Mouse's. If you're a warrior of equivalent rank and prestige as Kerplunk. The moment Mouse's Mouse touched the man's hands, the unmistakable sound of a, of a drop of water splashing into a pool somewhere, no, some when, captured his attention. The reverberating echo, however, was soon overwhelmed by the powerful music flooding into Mouse's consciousness. The man's personal song thundered through the physical connection between them with all the grace and subtlety of a military marching band rousing soldiers for battle. Drums pounded, cymbals crashed, and, and trumpets blared out in triumphant exultation. But those loud and brash instruments couldn't hide the quieter, deeper, and mournful melody of a single flute playing on the background <coughs> excuse me or the soft strumming of a stringed instrument that didn't recognize that he didn't recognize playing the hauntingly familiar notes of a long and tragic ballad gasping mouse's eyes widened kerplunk mouse hadn't heard anything the stranger had said as he was pulled up to unsteady feet it was only when he when he released his hand and stepped back that the, that the music faded into the background Right, son? The man's eyes narrowed. Are you hurt? I'm fine, Mouse replied, shaking his head. I'm sorry for getting in your way. No apologies needed, son. The man pressed the pouch, cold and wet from the puddle it had landed in into his hand. But I don't think you want to forget this. Thank you, he flinched at the prospect of touching the man's hand again, but I managed to close his fingers around the sodden pouch without any trouble. Dalton would have my hide if I lost this. He looked at the man with relief and a great deal of respect in his eyes. Where I grew up, I would, I would have lost this for sure. Well, we can't have that now, can we? The man stood up to his full height, somewhat north of six, somewhere north of six feet. He studied Mouse. You're a sailor, aren't you? Yes, sir, Mouse straightened up, pulling on the hem of his jacket and made a point of looking the man in the eyes. I am. What ship are you serving on? The hunter's ghost, sir, a galleon serving out of Vandermal on Dorton. Mouse sized up the man for the first time. He was likely in his 50s, but had aged well. His neatly trimmed brown beard was sprinkled with gray. His features were rough or quite refined, but certainly not delicate. He had the weathered complexion of someone who spent a great deal of time outside. He was also quite obviously a man of significant means. A pair of well-kept dueling blades hung from sheaths held up by a thick leather belt that was laden with other pouches and accoutrements. His black knee-high boots were polished to a high sheen. Excuse me, sir, but do I know you from somewhere? The big orc stiffened. The man smiled. It's certainly possible, son. His eyes twinkled. There's something that seems familiar about you as well, but I have a very good memory for such things, and I don't think we've ever met before. He winked. I've learned, however, that the world is both much smaller than it seems and rather full of surprises. Perhaps we are destined to meet again. Uh, maybe, Mouse blinked, surprised at the question, but I uh, don't get out much. We should go, the massive orc grunted, before the storm gets any closer. The man ignored his companions and continued to study Mouse. Tucking the pouch into his pocket, Mouse noticed the long, thin leather case dangling from the man's belt. It reminded him of the priceless treasure that was lost when his mother had died. 
Kerplunk. Sir? Yes? Are you, do you happen to have, a, happen to be a musician? The big orc scowled deepened. He took a menacing step closer, but the man stopped him with a small gesture. I've played a few songs in my day, the, man bro, the man's brow furrowed. Why do you ask? I, uh, Moss cleared his throat, was wondering if you might know of a shop in the city where I, uh, you know, uh, find, could find a practice flute. I doubt any shops will be open with, the storm, with this storm looming so close. The man's sharp gaze pierced him to the core. It was as if the man could tell he was, that, he unlike, that he likely couldn't afford to buy an instrument and was considering stealing one. Do you know how to play the flute? The mouse ducked his head, unable to meet the man's gaze. Yes, sir, I do, or rather I did. My mom, well, she taught me to play when I was younger, and uh, I would like to start practicing again. <laughs> Pushing aside the ache in his heart, he cast a furtive glance over his shoulder at the towering spires of the conservatory. If I can start playing again, Mouse squared his shoulders and looked the man in the eyes and puffed out his chest. Well, one day, I know I'll just be good enough to, to win a scholarship. We don't have time for this, friend, the orc's harsh voice cut through the quiet moment his voice dropping to a pleading whisper. The danger grows. Easy, friend, the man shrugged the orc's hand aside and took a step closer to Mouse. There must always be time for musicians to talk about making music, or life would simply not be worth living. Reaching inside his cloak, he pulled out a long and thin object that was wrapped in the length of a blue worn silk. The man peeled the cloth back, revealing a simple but well-made and worn wooden flute. His breath catching, Mouse's fingers twitched. There was sadness in the man's expression that was reflected by the sorrow in his softening song. Snorting, the orc tapped his staff on the cobblestones. Crack! The sharp report broke the reverie. The man plucked the flute from its wrapping and held it aloft with reverence. Son, take this. He presented it to Mouse with a flourish. It was my first instrument, given to, given to me by someone very dear when I was getting when I was getting ready to study at the conservatory far too many years ago. His gaze grew distant. She would have liked the idea of it going to another young student, I think. But sir, Mouse gulped, I was just looking, hoping really to find something. The ability to make beautiful music is a rare and precious gift, the man's jaw hardened. Such a gift cannot truly be bought, sold, or stolen. The man's expression softened. Music has changed my life, son, very much for the better. Hopefully this instrument will change your circumstances as well. Please accept it from one musician to another. I, Mouse shuffled back, waving his hands. I can't. The stranger stepped forward quickly, more quickly than he could, than he could retreat. Vibrant music washed over him as the man's song enveloped him in a powerful triumphant notes. He smiled down as Mouse at Mouse and pressed the flute into his hands. While his smile was broad, the tinge of sorrow never left his eyes. Kerplunk, take it, there was a hitch in his voice. I have been saving it for my, well, someone very dear to me, but that person has since passed away. The stranger closed Mouse's fingers around the flute. It would mean a great deal to, to know that an aspiring musician like I once was had it. The man arched a knowing eyebrow, and perhaps, and someday perhaps, you can return this kindness by giving the gift of music to someone else in their time of need. Kerplunk. With both of his hands wrapped around the precious instrument, the distant notes of another song slipped from the furthest recesses of Mouse's memory. The dream song. A hard lump formed in his throat. But how? The sweet melody of a single flute playing was as pure as it was beautiful. The deep and more ominous drum beat hinted at a looming danger that threatened the bright innocence and boundless love captured in the melody. The contrast sent shivers racing down his spine. He ached to hear more of the mysterious and familiar song, but even as he strained to hear it better, it faded back into the silence. A single whispered word echoed in his mind. Remember, remember, remember. When the man's fingers slipped from him, his and he stepped back, Mouse stood there trembling. The smooth, worn wood of the instrument was warm and reassuringly solid in his hands. Just a thank you, sir. He looked up at the benefactor. Can I have your name at least? 
Perhaps when we meet again, son, his smile warmed Mouse to the bone. Until then, it is best for each of us to be on our respective ways. Stepping back, his hand, he waved a hand in the direction from which Mouse had come. That storm is coming. If you wish to, to accomplish your errand, you should do so before it arrives. This one looks to be a real screecher. <laughs> Mouse bob, bobbed his head and hurried past man and orc. You take too many foolish risks, the orc whispered as, as Mouse brushed by. The man's reply was too low to be heard, but Mouse didn't care. His attention was focused on the instrument clutched in his hands and on the bright future he might be able to com compose for himself with it. That's chapter one. Let's Thank see. you so much. That's awesome. As as a flute player, I am really happy to hear this story. <laughs> That's awesome. really great. Uh, can I ask you, what was your favorite part about writing this book? I mean, I know that there are so many details involved, but did you have a particular favorite component when you were writing it? Um. I think the favorite part of writing this book was having two characters, both Mouse and Seldy, who each had unique ways of experiencing the world around them. And Mouse is, you know, you see that with his, um, with his hearing music when he touches people or gets close to them, he's hearing their inner music. And when he hears that, he learns about them. So mm -hmm. I had to every scene I was writing for Mouse, I would often just write out dialogue and actions and then I would remember, oh wait, but Mouse sees things and he experiences things differently. And I'd go back and have to layer in how he experienced the person he was meeting or the situation he was in and realizing that he's seeing things or hearing things that are different than what's actually taking place in conversations. That's really cool. That's like four dimensional <laughs> writing. You know, having an opportunity to write in layers like that. Yeah. And one of my, you know, one of the things I, one of the big reasons I went indie with this book is because I, I developed this thing called Sonic, that I call Sonic Markers. That sound, those sound markers that I do, the kerplunk uh -huh. or, or the sharp st staff on the crack of the, on the stone. Right. The sonic markers are like beats. They're important beats for important scenes. And he has, Mouse has the kerplunk, and Seldy has another one that's more of reminiscent of a heartbeat that, that I use in the most important scenes okay. in the book. And yeah, so, and you, you wanted to retain those. I, there was no yeah. way I was going to let an editor take those out or yeah. change how I wanted to tell the story because those sonic markers are key and critical to how the yeah. story. And it, it is unique to your author voice, and I'm so glad that you decided to retain that. I, I think that's a wonderful thing. It's one of the things I love most about indie author storytelling is that everyone has so much diversity. So yes. it, it's an opportunity for us to see storytelling in different ways every time we do this program. Absolutely. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. I hope you'll come back and read from another of your books another day. Absolutely. Maybe I'll read a Selby chapter sometime or I'll bring up the Omega Rising, which is Rusty Bones and a whole different kind of character. So Perfect. I look forward to that. Thank uh, you for your time today, Doug. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Diana. Have a great night. You too.